Binion family back then were pretty much the Sopranos of Las Vegas. Ted Binion had a lifelong addiction to drugs and alcohol. I was in no way surprised that his lifestyle had caught up with him. Ted Binion died of a drug and heroin overdose. We do not agree that this was a suicide or an accidental overdose. It has all the hooks that you would expect out of a Las Vegas murder case. Casino heirs, a beautiful woman, an affair, mysterious death, and a lot of intrigue. Ted Binion was the son of one of Las Vegas' founding fathers, Benny Binion. Ted was described by those who knew him as a fast-living, hard-drinking drug addict. So when he was found dead on the floor of his den, everyone, including the police, believed it to be a drug overdose. The story might have ended there if it weren't for some suspicious actions after his death by those in his inner circle. It's a bizarre tale that could only happen in Vegas. I think to understand this story, you have to understand Las Vegas. Las Vegas is a city that's driven by money. It's a money town, and it always has been a money town. Benny Binion is an old school casino guy. Uh, he's from the Dallas, Texas area, and was involved in, you know, what we would call backdoor gambling operations. It was completely illegal but he somehow managed to avoid law enforcement while conducting a very comprehensive gaming operation. And so he was an outlaw. When Benny Binion came to Las Vegas, it was a far different city than it is now. It was the 1940s. There was only a few thousand people who lived here. And uh, there was one thing that really drew him here, and that was the ability to run a legal gambling operation. During the 40s, downtown was a sawdust place. I mean, it was a, people rode on horses uh, to get to the, the casinos. Benny, he bought two real sawdust joints, the Apache and the El Dorado, and he uh, combined them. Downtown Las Vegas, never seen anything like that in his life. And he called it the Horseshoe Club. The Horseshoe was known as the locals casino. It was the place where if you wanted to have a beer for less than $2, you could find it. You could have a T-bone steak for less than $10. And there's a very uh, famous story about Binion, about taking a million dollar bet that no one else would take. It was a red versus green bet on the roulette wheel. Benny Binion lost and he promptly paid it. You know, these are the type of stories that make gambling legend. And I remembered it. I, I used to come here with my family. He, he put a, a display right in front of the door of a million dollars in, in $10,000 bill, $110,000 bill. And everybody wanted to take their picture in front of this display. People thought the Binion family back then were pretty much the Sopranos of Las Vegas. You could not uh, mess with that family. Anybody who, who tried to cheat in their casino usually ended up in the basement beat up. Uh, at the same time, they were connected to a lot of um, uh, mafia types in town. It was Bugsy Siegel, Meyer Lansky on the strip, and it was Benny Binion and Glitter Gulch uh, downtown. Ted Binion was Benny Binion's son, and he was just like his father a very colorful, larger-than-life personality. To call Ted a character would be to do him a disservice. It's an, uh, a vast understatement. Ted was a wild man, but he also had this uncanny ability with numbers. He was a sharp, he understood the business. You know, this is a family that's steeped in the, in the gambling business. Ted Binion was, as I said, a, an excellent uh, owner of the casino along with his father, but he, um, he did get his, license, his gaming license suspended by the gaming board because of illicit use of drugs. His gaming license in the state of Nevada was very important to him. And when he lost that, he kind of spiraled out of control. So he could no, could no longer really control his drug and alcohol habits. 
Ted Binion had a lifelong addiction to drugs and alcohol. You know, those who were close to him said that he was a heroin addict who did what they call chasing the dragon. Ted Binion was married, and the story has it that the day that his wife left him, he went to Cheetah's strip club, and uh, he ran into a woman named Sandy Murphy. Word has it he was immediately struck by her, as many men were, very beautiful, alluring, attractive woman. And they hit it off immediately. Sandy Murphy came to Las Vegas on a trip with some of her girlfriends. And she uh, ended up in uh, Caesar's Palace gambling and lost about $13,000 on the tables. So she frequented in cheetahs selling uh, outfits to the men here for their girlfriends or wives. Try to get her $13,000 back. That was uh, what was she alleged. The relationship was volatile. I believe the police were called a couple of times to the residence. Uh, I know that, that Ted complained about the relationship to people as it wore on. So Ted Binion dies. They find him on his living room floor. Sandy Murphy was the initial 911 caller. Las Vegas police, when they first entered the house, found a bottle of Xanax next to his body, further evidence of heroin use in the home. So the immediate assumption was that this was a drug overdose. They also knew who Ted Binion was. It was well known that Ted Binion was a drug addict. And so everything pointed towards a drug overdose. I was in no way surprised that his lifestyle had caught up with him. And that was my first thought, that uh, boy, he, he really must have hung one on this time, and uh, he couldn't uh, pull out of it. The police found out that his drug dealer had been there the night before, gave him 12 bags of tar heroin, and they decided it was a suicide. Uh, they felt like it was just wrapped up in a nice, neat bow, and that was the end of it. Um, the problem is, the Binion family realized that, first of all, Ted never slept on the floor. He never ingested heroin. He always smoked it. And the contents of his stomach had heroin in it. Ted Binion circulated in circles of people that you and I wouldn't circulate with. He was definitively linked to a guy named Fat Herbie Blitzstein. Fat Herbie Blitzstein is a street-level mobster who was associated with a guy named Tony Spilatro, who's one of the most notorious gangsters in mafia history. Any uh, investigation of the death of Ted Binion would include a wide range from persons he knew in the drug business to other gamblers uh, to, of course, people involved with organized crime. There were all kinds of people who might have been willing to take a shot at him in order to, uh, to separate him from his money. Ted Binion didn't trust banks. He didn't trust the traditional financial institutions. So he stored his silver in an underground vault in the desert about an hour and 15 minutes outside of Las Vegas in Prompt, Nevada. What really changed everything was two days after Ted died, the authorities in Nye County found a guy named Rick Tabish at the vault with a truck filled with millions of dollars of Ted Binion silver. Excavating silver at night in Pahrump uh, certainly wasn't a good look for Rick at that time. In the eyes of law enforcement, it was highly suspicious behavior that pointed to the possibility that maybe this wasn't a drug overdose after all. When Rick Tabish was arrested for attempting to rob Ted Binion's underground vault of millions of dollars in silver, investigators began to take a second look at Binion's death. Was this robbery just a crime of convenience, or could Tabish somehow be connected to Binion's untimely passing? Rick Tabish and Teddy Binion, according to the stories that I had been told, met each other standing at a urinal. It's an only in Las Vegas type of encounter. They struck up a close friendship, and uh, Rick Tabish was kind of what you would describe as a handyman. He's very skilled in construction. Ted 
Palestinian had, they allege, about $14 million in silver. In the, uh, in the Binion uh, counting room, when he couldn't set foot in the, in the uh, establishment anymore because of the uh, gaming commission, he decided he better get his silver out of there pronto. So he hired this new friend of his, Rick Tabish, to dig a big hole, put a, a vault in there, and bury his silver in a town called Pahrump, Nevada. After they found Ted Binion uh, dead in his home, a day or two later, lo and behold, uh, Tabish went up to Pahrump in the middle of the night, one, two in the morning, with excavating equipment, dug all the silver, police observed him, and they arrested him. When Rick was found by the sheriffs in Pahrump, uh, excavating the silver, um, his position was he was given permission by Ted. Ted had told him if something happened to me, secure the silver for my daughter, Bonnie. Uh, but uh, excavating silver at night in Pahrump uh, certainly wasn't a good look for Rick at that time. To everyone's surprise, right after Rick Tabish was arrested, Sandy Murphy bailed him out. And this really fueled the speculation that there was something going on here. Why would uh, this woman who was grieving the loss of her uh, fiance, who had provided everything for her, be bailing out a man who was caught with all his silver in a, in a huge 18-wheeler? Uh, you know, it just really led to a lot of speculation that Sandy Murphy and Rick Tabish were having an affair. And all of a sudden, the portrait of uh, the grieving Sandy Murphy was different. And, and it changed really rapidly from Sandy Murphy grieving for Ted Binion's death to, oh, look at the gold digger. And all of a sudden, she was, uh, became much more difficult to defend in the court of public opinion. I think Ted was suspected in an affair because what we do know is that in the days prior to his death, things had changed for Ted and how he viewed Sandy. He was no longer enamored with her, and he had made the decision to have her removed from his will. There were suspicions uh, by the Binion family that there was more to the story than just the affair and that, you know, Rick and Sandy had planned or orchestrated um, Ted's death as a result of the affair. When Ted Binion was initially found dead, there were some suspicious pieces of evidence that drew some attention. One was how Sandy Murphy acted at the crime scene. And when you listen to the 911 tape, you hear a woman who is in almost inaudible hysterics. And it was perceived by many to be fake. Breathing. Yeah, there's no question that after Ted Binion's death, every move she made seemed suspicious. And, of course, because the, there were investigators looking at the case, every move that she made was pretty well chronicled. No, I want everyone to see everything. Okay. I want everything shown. I don't want anything missing. There's another very important piece of circumstantial evidence in this case, and it is a video of Sandra Murphy going through the house days after Ted Binion's death. Okay, everything in here, make sure you get a good view of all this, because don't worry, this is what they came to steal. And frankly, she seems like she's on a rampage, pointing out everything that should be hers. And uh, I'm going to leave the Luther Gunther, but I'm going to take the Vargas, because I don't trust it. And if it's gone, I'm screwed. Everything that's of value that's missing from the home, and she thinks that Ted's family has gone in and taken the stuff without her permission. And it becomes abundantly clear when you watch the video, undisputed, that she's very concerned about money. Uh, here's a picture of the keys there and the box being opened and the money missing. There's $20,000 in the house. Is that the house? 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 In the eyes of law enforcement, it was highly suspicious behavior that pointed to the possibility that maybe this wasn't a drug overdose after all. 
police had no confession. They knew they had no eyewitness. So they tried to build a, a, a circumstantial case. People couldn't get enough of this story. It has all the hooks that you would expect out of a Las Vegas murder case. A beautiful woman, a casino heir, a mysterious death, the theft of silver in the middle of the night, drug use, an alleged affair. You know, and this was all in the first few weeks. The only question was, what was going to be the ending? They were partners in this, in this process. Uh, that, was, that much was clear. Uh, what was less clear was how they were going to defend themselves against what was really mounting evidence. While the actions of Sandy Murphy and Rick Tabish appeared suspicious, investigators had no hard evidence or proof of their involvement. To complicate things, the coroner had already ruled Binion's death an apparent drug overdose. But the Binion family was not satisfied with that conclusion, and they decided to take matters into their own hands. The big reason why no one was arrested right out of the gate was the initial evidence pointed towards a drug overdose. And it was very plausible that this was a drug overdose. Of course, the cops need to have definitive proof in their view that it is, in fact, a homicide. So the estate of Ted Binion hired a private investigator by the name of Tom Dillard. Dig up anything you can. And this was uh, uh, the Binion family. We do not agree that this was a suicide or an accidental overdose. The undercover, they were lovers. And uh, right away, uh, uh, he found out they were going to a hotel somewhere in California, and that uh, doesn't bode well for Sandy. Tom Dillard is a former homicide detective with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. He's an excellent detective. And he just started pounding the pavement, interviewing witnesses, putting things together. Is this really a drug overdose, or is there something more going on here? And what he uncovered was a lot of witnesses who told of very suspicious behavior. As the weeks wore on, there were more and more stories being written they were really getting pounded in the press. And so uh, one night, they decided that they'd take a, a shot to, to sit, uh, have me uh, interview them and I, out, away from their lawyer. And we met at a, at a local bar, and, and uh, she, was, she was quite nervous and quite emotional. He was uh, adamant about his innocence, and uh, as she was about hers. They were partners in this, in this process. Uh, that, was, that much was clear. Uh, what was less clear was how they were going to defend themselves against what was really mounting evidence. Tom Dillard just did nothing for months but uh, try to build a case against uh, Rick Tabish and Sandy Murphy. He dug up an awful lot of stuff on them that, that built a circumstantial case against them. So Tom Dillard brings his case to District Attorney David Rogers and David Rogers builds a case based on Tom Dillard's investigation. The district attorney's office and the police department uh, found one of the most famous pathologists in all of America, Michael Bodden, who uh, opined that, in fact, Ted Binion was murdered, that he was killed by a very rare uh, mechanism of homicide known as burking. There was a man named John Burke that uh, used to um kill people with the help of an uh, accomplice. He sat on his chest, and the other accomplice put the, his hand on the mouth of the, and, and uh, there, there it came, that's the uh, name Birking. Dr. Bodden came up with this a theory that they had suffocated him, that he was burked, and that's how he died. The idea of burking, as I say, the only time I think anyone really ever ran into it was this old Boris Kalaf Murphy. This involved, uh, in Mr. Bodden's view, a deliberate plan to force Ted Binion to ingest drugs, specifically heroin and Xanax, and um, make it look like a drug overdose. Once that hit, that was it. Then the murder charge could stick, because now they had a means to which he was murdered, and they can pin it on Sandy and Rick. Rick and Sandy are charged with um, burglary, grand larceny, 
robbery, extortion, and murder, and conspiracy to commit all of those. What I think happened in this case uh, is that ultimately uh, the Binion family um, had to have come up with a theory that was not a theory that Ted Binion died of a drug and heroin overdose because it was a blemish on the family and a uh, family that was a proud family and a family that, uh, you know, was here for many, for in Las Vegas for many, many generations. And, and the fact that Sandy was having an affair with Rick Tavish, I think ultimately, you know, led uh, to her being targeted as a suspect in the case. They didn't want this, this uh, mistress, this stripper to have a one cent of the Binion money. So they, they knew, of course, if she was found guilty of murder, even if it was in a will, she wouldn't be entitled to anything. I think the uh, Binion trial was the trial of the century here in Las Vegas, Nevada. It was just a mass of people and media. And the judge turned to me and said, Al, I think we're going to need a bigger boat. With the evidence Tom Dillard had turned over to the district attorney, prosecutors went to trial confident in their case against Sandy Murphy and Rick Tavish. But would it be enough to prove to a jury that they plotted and carried out the murder of Ted Binion, then covered it up? All right, this is the time set for trial in case number C-161663, State of Nevada versus Richard Tabish and Sandra Murphy. Uh, I think the, uh, the Binion trial was the, uh, the, uh, the trial of the century here in Las Vegas, Nevada. It had everything, sex, murder, silver, intrigue. This case was like the circus. The courtroom filled up with reporters, and, and there was that overflow uh, factor to it, that it became, uh, you know, something that was of really high news value in that kind of uh, tabloid sense. I remember right at the start of it, the judge's chambers used to look out over the front of the courthouse. It was just a mass of people and media. Pretty much you couldn't see the, the steps of the courthouse. And the judge turned to me and said, Al, I think we're going to need a bigger boat. Are we ready for opening statements? Mr. Roger, are you going to provide that, or Mr. Wall? Proceed. A Sandra Murphy led a pretty good life uh, when she lived uh, with Ted Binion. And I'm not uh, suggesting uh, that uh, it's always a day at the beach uh, living with a drug addict, uh, but she had ma many material items. July 9, 1998, uh, Ted Binion did a codicil to his will. And, and this codicil is kind of like an amendment. And, and what he did is he put the Sandra Murphy in this will and provided uh, that she was uh, to get uh, the Palomino residence. Uh, she was to get the, the contents of the house, as well as $300,000. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, the evidence will prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Ted Binion was murdered. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the killers are Richard Tabish and Sandra Murphy. Thank you. You had two just outstanding prosecutors. You had uh, Dave Roger uh, was just, just like a freight train and wall. I mean, he was just uh, brilliant. And their theory was that uh, Ted Binion had been killed for the money. This case is not about homicide. This case is about heroin. This case is not murder. This case is about money. I'm gonna talk about the Binion money machine, as I said to you, from one of the most powerful families in the state of Nevada. And what the intent is, is to grind up this young lady, Sandy Murphy, in the next month or two months. 
They took this case from a drug overdose and turned it around and made it a homicide. That's what this family has done. That's what Mr. Dillard has done. And why? Why did they do this? <clears throat> it's because Sandy is not a opinion. That's why. The defense said that it was a, it was a completely overdose, be it accidental or, or purpose, and it had nothing to do with any murder. It, it was the Binion money machine that didn't want her to inherit anything. Do you know an individual by the name of Rick Tabish? Yes, I do. How do you know Rick Tabish? We basically grew up together, became closer friends in high school. Uh, his family and my family are friends from years past. Mr. Grotzer, I want to direct your attention to the end of August or beginning of September of 1998. Uh, do you recall having a particular conversation uh, with Mr. Tabish? Yes. He told me that there was a, a former casino owner in Las Vegas that he had, he had some business arrangements with that was backing out on him and owed him some money and wasn't paying it and he wanted to utilize my services to help him in <coughs> killing this man. Gratzer and Tabish tried to come up with a plan uh, to kill a casino boss in Las Vegas and thought of all different ways of doing it. It was bizarre. We kind of laughed and joked about jumping out of a helicopter and doing all this crazy sort of uh, G.I. Joe stuff. And uh, crawling up to close to this house where this man would probably be behind a window and shooting him with Rick's 378 Weatherby Magnum. I rejected it. I tried to reject every one of these methods to prevent myself from actually having to go ahead and do these things. Here's the thing, as strange as he was and as strange as his testimony was, he had corroboration too, because he went out and asked people, hey, how would I kill a casino boss that Rick Tabish wants me to kill in Vegas? He actually called a pharmacist to see how much drugs someone would have to ingest for an overdose. Have a seat. State your name and spell your first name and your last name for the record. Dana Perry. In 1998, where were you working? At Neiman Marcus. Uh, what did you do at Neiman Marcus? A, mani a manicurist. Did there come a point in time when a person by the name of Sandy came in for a manicure? Yes. Did there come a point in time when uh, Sandra Murphy spoke about uh, Ted Binion and his future? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, did uh, Ms. Murphy uh, uh, make any comments about uh, Ted Binion's future? He wasn't going to be around. Uh, what did she say? That he was going to die of a drug overdose. Uh, do you remember specifically what she said? He was going to die of a drug overdose. Did she tell you when he was going to die of a drug overdose? Within three weeks. Uh, did she tell you what type of drug overdose that he was going to experience within three weeks? Heroin. Perry's testimony was powerful. That was a big part of the trial. Loose lips sink ships. Of course you shake your head. Why she would tell her manicurist these things is just so unusual and bizarre. My opinion is he died of asphyxia by suffocation and pressure on his chest. It's that specifically called burking. The biggest witness for the prosecution was arguably forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Bodden. The state was banking on his burking theory to convince the jury that this was not a mere drug overdose, but a premeditated murder. Dr. Bodden, have you had an opportunity to review photographs from the scene at Palomino taken on September 17th, 1998, where Mr. Binion was found? Yes. Okay. Uh, 
using those photographs, describe for us uh, the types, the type of injury depicted on those. I mean, we know them as bruises, but in, in your capacity, describe to us the significance and characteristics of those particular injuries. Uh, there uh, is a bruise on the back, uh, the side of the back, that on section shows abundant fresh hemorrhage underneath the skin. And how is that uh, caused based on your experience? By, by a blunt impact trauma of some kind. So it could have been a bump against a table, it could have been a punch, it could have been a fall, I can't tell. When you say it's fresh hemorrhage, what does that mean? That it happened around the time of death. Dr. Bodden took note of some very important facts in regards to the coroner's office uh, investigation. Uh, describe for us um, the significant findings as a forensic pathologist that you see in exhibits 82 and then 149 through 152, which were taken during the autopsy. Yes, and it shows in the middle of the photograph two patterned abrasions. One is a direct imprint, circular imprint with a hole in the center, and the other is a similar imprint which has been rubbed or abraded on the inner portion. Mr. Bodno opined that this was caused by someone forcibly getting on top of Ted Binion, pressing down real hard on his chest, and it was possibly an abrasion from a button mark. My opinion is he died of asphyxia by suffocation. He died from some obstruction to his nose and mouth, couldn't breathe in, and pressure on his chest. That's, That's specifically called burking. It was, it was extremely, um, it was unique, I guess the only way to say it. But here you have the world-renowned pathologist coming in to say, and this is why uh, Ted Binion died, and uh, the district attorney, I believe, was looking for that, that hook. And they found it with Dr. Bodden. It's a sad situation. There's a man that had everything you could possibly want in this life. He had a gaming license. He came from one of the most reputable and great families of the state of Nevada. That's not good enough. Wealth was millions of dollars. That's not good enough. Everything you could possibly want, and all you have to do is one thing. You just don't have to do drugs. But you couldn't get it on. He couldn't stop using heroin. You know, you, you hear about Janis Joplin, some celebrities, uh, Jimi Hendrix, Lenny Bruce, Billie Holiday, Keith Moon, uh, the drummer for The Who. They all, all these people died because of heroin use. Now, did they have plans the next day? Yeah, they had plans the next day. Because people, especially heroin junkies, don't always know whether they're going to survive the heroin use. And so, you know, this is nothing out of the ordinary, even aside from suicide. What I'm saying to you is, is that junkies, heroin junkies, overdose all the time. Ted Bidian had a history of drug use, and his drug and alcohol abuse was magnified after he lost, lost his gaming license. It was a clear case of a drug overdose. Uh, Mr. Palazzo and Mr. Mamet suggest to you that there's no evidence at all here of a murder. On behalf of the state of Nevada, I disagree. You have evidence of motive, of corroborated intent, of opportunity, uh, corroborated admissions by both of them, both before and after, about a plan to kill Ted Binion, possession of property stolen from the house at the time of the murder, signature crimes, and an attempt to buy testimony. Uh, in the law, we call that proof beyond a reasonable doubt six ways. Because it's the Binion money that these two wanted more than anything else. It is the whole purpose of all of these crimes. The Binion money machine framed us. They would have given anything to be part of the Binion money. She had it for a while and was getting kicked out. He didn't. They wanted it and each other 
enough to kill an eccentric, wealthy heroin addict. The jury had deliberated for eight days, and that's a long time. But come verdict time, there was a lot of pressure. It was intense. And the, the judge just did what he had to do and had them read the verdict. Read the jury in the above entitled case, find the defendant Richard Bennett Tabish as follows. Guilty of murder of the first degree. Read the jury in the above entitled case, find the defendant Sandra Renee Murphy as follows. Guilty of murder of the first degree. They were convicted of murder and many other felonies and were sentenced to many decades in prison. And we all thought, OK, this incredible story is finally over. But it wasn't. And the reason it wasn't over is because the Nevada Supreme Court reversed their convictions on appeal. They were reversed on technicalities. Jim Brown, the lawyer for Ted Binion, had said that Ted had told him, hey, if something happens to me, uh, you know what happened. Take Sandy out of my will. Well, that was allowed during the first trial. The Supremes later on said that's as if Ted was talking from the grave. It was impermissible hearsay. And Jim Brown should not have been allowed to testify to that. The story that we thought was over is not over. And it got even more interesting. I don't think there was the evidence to convict them. There's no smoking gun. Uh, there was a lot of heroin smoking, but no smoking gun. A year after the Nevada Supreme Court overturned their conviction for the murder of Ted Binion, Sandy Murphy and Rick Tavish were back in court for trial number two. This time, they had a powerhouse defense team. The second trial was different for a few reasons. Number one, Tony Serra, a great attorney out of San Francisco, was brought in. We were able to assemble a team uh, that was different than our first trial. Uh, to, uh, the famous, uh, infamous uh, Tony Serra, who I admire very much, uh, joined the defense team on behalf of Rick Tavish. I uh, stepped in and represented Sandy Murphy. I heard a lot about Tony Serra, read about him, and I heard he gives, he gives hell to judges. Uh, he's a tough hombre. Right as soon as he uh, appeared, I, I sort of got it straight with him. I said, Mr. Serra, I heard about your reputation. It's not going to work with me because I could yell. I could yell louder than you. One of the things that we wanted to do uh, in the second trial that wasn't done in the first trial is really humanize her. In the first trial, she was really made out to be kind of somebody who was callous, indifferent. I mean, that really wasn't her. Second trials are just easier. You make mistakes in the first trial. The second trial, you don't make the same mistakes. Another reason, Dr. Bodden, his testimony was ripped to shreds. I hate to say it, but it was. One of the things that we were able to bring to light was Dr. Bodden's theory of burking. And what we were able to do to dismiss that theory is magnify the impression mark or the button mark as Dr. Bodden testified to. And in reality, when you magnify the impression, you see that it's not a button impression, impression at all, that it's a carcinoma. It is clear that it was some type of skin uh, lesion. I believe that uh, Dr. Bodden is qualified and as great a, a, a pathologist that he is, uh, he was, uh, his theories were put to the test and I don't think the jury uh, bought Barking in the second trial. And I think that was the difference. Another th issue that came up during the first trial that was dismissed in the second trial were the witnesses. Some of the witnesses, they were actually paid for their testimony in the first trial. Grotzer, Deanna Perry, uh, the hairstylists, and some of the other witnesses that bolstered the prosecution's theory of the case. Though that testimony was ultimately dismissed. You know, prison has a way of humbling you. And I'm sure their attorneys spoke to them about this. And during the second trial, there was no googly eyes. There was no laughing. There was no joking. There was no smirking. It was all business. 
and they think the gravity of the situation, they realize in the second trial, and I do believe that second jury realized that, and I believe that helped them tremendously. As a trial lawyer, you know, you win cases that you think you're going to lose, and you lose cases that you think you're going to win. Uh, so when it goes to a jury, you really don't know. Um, what we did know and what we believed is that the state did not prove their case. I think most people thought they were going to be found guilty again, but uh, came out a different way. It's a jury, they said, not guilty of murder, but they did find them guilty of burglary of the silver, both of them. I don't think there was the evidence to convict them. Yeah, I, I think that there was a lot of evidence. I'm not so sure there wasn't a kind of built-in reasonable doubt given the circumstances surrounding Ted Binion's life. There's no smoking gun. Uh, there was a lot of heroin smoking, but no smoking gun. Rick spent a considerable more time in, co in custody, incarcerated. Sandy spent four years in the Nevada woman's uh, prison. Uh, and she expired that sentence, so she never did any additional time. Maintained close with Sandy and her family, and um, she's been able to rebuild her life and, and have two beautiful children and a husband, and uh, I'm fortunate enough to be God, a father to her children, and so we've maintained a close relationship over the years. I think the town was shocked. You know, we'd been through one guilty verdict. So the presumption is, well, they're probably gonna be found guilty again. The acquittals stunned a lot of people. That doesn't mean it wasn't the right decision. Maybe it was the right verdict, you know, and the most important thing of the legal system is we have to re respect how it works and re respect the rule of law and respect a jury's verdict. I think it's the fundamental lesson that, that gets lost uh, in media with cases, and, and that is that juries don't always get it right. Uh, sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong. Uh, luckily, uh, Rick Tabish and Sandy Murphy got a second chance at it, and the second time they, they got it right. And especially now in this area of DNA, we are finding out that more and more is that when people get on the jury, uh, they don't become infallible, none of us are. So I, I've been asked that question a lot. Why, how do you feel about the fact that they were found guilty the first time and then Rick and Sandy are found not guilty the second time? And all I can say to that is when you work for the court system, you learn things that the public doesn't know behind the scenes. You hear things about the crimes that no one else knows, but you're entrusted not to speak about those things even 20 some years later. But I can say this about it. I think even though it seems like a contradiction, justice was served in both trials. And that's really all I can say about that. Sandy Murphy is now Sandy Pierpen. She lives in Southern California and owns an art gallery with her husband in Laguna Beach. Rick Tabish lives in Montana. He's the owner and president of a construction company. They both deny having anything to do with the death of Ted Binion. I'm Tamron Hall, thank you for watching someone they knew.